Hello and welcome to Ms. Ma's Advanced Functions class. This is 3.1, Exploring Polynomial Functions. So a polynomial is an expression in this form, a sub n to the times x to the n plus a sub n minus 1 times x to the n minus 1 and so forth, um, all the way down to a naught, which is a constant term. It's a constant term with no x's involved. So you can see that the polynomial is really just all these terms with x to the power something all added together. And a standard form is when the powers are arranged in descending order. So 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, or whatever the degree is. The degree is the highest exponent of the polynomial. So in this case, the highest exponent is degree n. Okay, so we call that a degree n polynomial. And one more definition for now. Um, you've often probably heard teachers use zero root and x-intercept interchangeably. Um, but now we're going to have to learn a little bit of a difference. The x-intercept is wherever it touches the x-axis, right? Whatever the function is, it touches the x-axis at certain places, and that's called the x-intercept. Um, now, a zero or a root is actually when the function is equal to zero. So uh, this seems like a fine difference, except when you think about something like, well, let's say f of x equals x squared plus 4 right? This has no x-intercepts because, you know, it should look like it hovers above and it's got a vertex at 0, 4, um, and so it has no x-intercepts, but it does have two zeros. If you set this to be equal to 0, we could actually solve for it. We'll move it over and square root it, and we actually get plus minus the square root of negative 4 as x. And if you know anything about imaginary numbers, we know that the imaginary number is called i, and that's equal to the root of negative 1. So we know that this isn't a real number because, you know, you can't have, um, you can't square something and then have it to be negative, um, but we can imagine that there is such a number, so that's why it's called the imaginary number, and anything involving imaginary numbers are called complex. So this is the square root of plus minus the square root of 4, which is 2, um, times the square root of negative 1, which is i. So these are, these are the roots of the function. Um, so these are actually called complex roots. And we have two of them. We have plus 2i and minus 2i, and so there are two of them. And whatever the degree is, you can see here the degree is 2, we have to have that many roots. So a function must have n roots, okay? If the degree is 2, then I have to have two roots. And they could be complex or they could be um, real. It depends on the function. So it's a little bit different from the x-intercept. So if you think about the quadratic, which you should have lots of experience in, we can have a few different cases. So you've seen before the distinct roots where you just have, you know, we're touching the x-axis twice, opening up or down, and so these are called distinct roots, and each of those has two distinct roots. That's what it looks like on the graph. Um, you also see in equal roots where basically we have the vertex on the x-axis. You can just pretend there for me. I made a nice big dot which solves all of our woes, and so we say that has two equal roots, or we might say that it has one pair of equal roots, which means the same thing. Uh, and then, of course, we've got the type of quadratic where we're hovering above or hovering below the axis, and that then we'd say they, ha they have two complex roots like this. Okay? So we're just kind of redefining roots for you here. Now the cubic, the cubic function is a degree 3, if you've never heard the term before, we got degree 3, and usually we'll write degree with a delta like this. So it's a degree 3 polynomial, like y equals x cubed, which is the parent function, and it kind of looks like this, it looks like a parabola going upwards, but a little steeper, and then going downwards on the other side. But a lot of um, cubic functions that get transformed, they look like this, where We've got a one-hump camel facing that way, or you could draw it the other way as well. A lot of them look like this, okay? So let's talk about how we might get a combination of equal roots, complex, root, complex roots, and distinct roots. Because in class, you're going to do a little investigation where you are going to have to draw all the different cases for a quartic and a quintic. So let's do it for a cubic, and then maybe that'll give you an idea for the other ones. Okay, so if it looks like this, then there are a few possibilities, right? I could try having this 
actually, first of all, um, I could just transform x cubed, so I could have three equal roots. And you can see that x cubed has three equal roots because x cubed equals zero means that x times x times x equals zero, so zero, x equals zero, or x equals zero, or x equals zero, that's all the same thing, so they're equal roots. Um, and so that could be anywhere along the x-axis, like this. So I could get three equal roots, and it's going to look like x cubed, so it's sort of bendy in the middle. We call that a saddle point. Um, and then, of course, we could get something that has, um, that goes through like this, right, where we're going through three times. You can see it just goes straight through every time, so those are called distinct roots, and you have three distinct roots, so it's possible to get three distinct roots. Those are real roots. Um, and then, of course, we have combinations where maybe this hump is like a little bit lower, or or lower here, or maybe, you know, this side, it's above. So we could have something, we'll draw them out, so something like this, where it's hovering above, um, or hovering below, like that. So those are, now I've got one distinct, and you can see I've got no other, it's not touching at all, but I have to have three roots, so this is uh, one distinct root, and two complex roots. And you can't see the shape of a complex root. It's not really this turning point or anything. It's just because it's not on the real plane. It's an imaginary plane. So you can't imagine them. Um, so we just kind of draw whatever um, humps that we want to make sure it looks like a cubic root there. Um, and then, of course, we could try moving this down so it just touches the axis. So um, we could get something like this, where it touches it once, and touches it once. So you can see I've got one distinct root and two, two equal roots. So one distinct and two equal, or one pair of equal. And that gives us three roots overall. So these are the different scenarios we could have for the cubic function. Okay. All right, here's some of the other properties of the polynomials. The nth finite differences of a polynomial function of degree n are constant, as in, you know, the first differences are the same, then it must be a line, right? If the second differences are the same, then it's a quadratic. If the third differences are the same, it's a qu it's a cubic. If the fourth differences are the same, it's a quartic. Fifth difference is quintic, and so forth. Okay, so that's the nth finite differences. We call them the finite differences because we could have first, second, third, fourth, etc. Um, and also something that's really helpful is that they don't have any horizontal or vertical asymptotes, so it's easier to draw them in that sense that you don't have to follow any asymptotes. The domain is always x and r. We can put any number into um, a polynomial and get a number. And then the range, well, it depends whether or not you have an even degree or an odd degree polynomial. So let's look at some of the shapes right now. If you have a degree zero polynomial, what does that graph look like? Well, that's something like y equals 5, which is a horizontal line. So it's actually a horizontal line that is degree zero. Okay. Degree one is the line, so it could be, you know, a positive slope or a negative slope. Degree two is the quadratic, so it could be opening upwards or downwards. Degree three is the cubic, so we just saw it. It looks like a one hump camel like this, or a one hump camel facing the other way. Degree four. Well, it actually looks like a saggy butt, or could be a mountain facing the other way. And degree five, it's like a two hump camel. So it's got like two humps and then it goes up, or facing the other way, two hump camel. And these humps can be higher or lower, depends. Okay? Um, so let's talk about what a global minimum or maximum is versus a local minimum or maximum. So 
you know that if you were in our school, William Lane McKenzie, and uh, you are like the number one athlete, okay? Let's say you're the number one athlete in our school. Uh, let's say you're a good soccer player or something like that, okay? So you're the number one soccer player in our whole school for whatever it is. So just because you're the number one athlete in our school doesn't mean that you're a number one athlete in the world, right? Because there's like all sorts of awesome soccer players, uh, and I'm not a soccer player so or follower, so I have no idea who those people would be. But uh, you are, you know, you are not necessarily number one in the world, right? So it just because you are top in our school doesn't mean that you would be top in the world. There's someone all the way at the top, and they are at the global max, right? They're the world world's number one versus max number one, which is, you know, uh, also awesome to be, but not quite the same. So here's the world's number one athlete, and here's you. You're like, you know, close, but not, but not, not quite, okay? So that's the difference between the global and the local, and of course, um, we can have the minimum as well. You can have, you know, the lowest of the low down here. Let's say this is like the lowest valley, and this is like, you know, where we live. It's not that low, but it's not the lowest in the world, so it could be a minimum. Okay, so that's the difference between having a local and a global. So if you look at the degree, even degrees, like this, degree 2 and degree 4, you can see that, well, here I'm going to have a minimum, and here I'm going to have a maximum, and because it only turns once, the local is equal to the global, um, in this case local minimum is the global minimum, and here local maximum is the global maximum, but here, you know, if this is not at the same level, this one is not quite as low as that one, so this is a local minimum, but this is the global, global minimum, so that's a little bit different, and this one has a local maximum and then a global maximum. And you can see, well, this guy is the max in his area, but he's also max in the world. So, you know, that, that makes him global and local. I'm just going to draw him again so it's a little bit neater. So, when you have a degree that's even, you can have a global minimum or a global maximum, but you can't have both. If you look at the odd degree, I was about to choose purple, which would end up being really ugly odd degree, like degree 3 or degree 5, oops, you can see that this might be a local maximum, but it goes off into infinity, so there is no, there is no um, global maximum, and this might be our local minimum, but it goes off into negative infinity, so there is no local minimum, so, and that's true for degree 5 as well. So, to sum that up, if you think about the odd degree polynomials, you might have locals, but you can go all the way down and all the way up, so you know that the range is going to be um, y in r with no limitations, okay? But with the uh, even degree, if you look at it, you can see, okay, I might have a local minimum or maximum, so um, I have to... I have to limit it, so y is going to be less than or equal to my local max, or it's possible that y is in r such that y is greater than or equal to our local minimum. Oops, I'm using the wrong term, it should be global, global, global. Okay, and so that is how we would decide on the range. And that is all the properties of polynomials that we are going to learn for now. Um, we will be applying this in class, so I will see you then. Thanks for watching.